in the never-ending fight of Far East manufacturers to bring high volume and low-cost 3D printers to the market, it's refreshing to see Hobby King continue their Mini Fabricator line with this, the Mini Fabricator V2. Straight out of the box, I was planning to do a review. So, in light of that, I decided to take notes of everything that happened, everything I decided to do, any faults I had, any good things, and so I have a good documentation, well, quite a few pages, of the sort of comments I made, and we're gonna go through those, the process I went through, to see if this printer is suitable for a beginner. Could you expect a beginner to do all the things that I had to do, or was it just a smooth trail all the way through the instructions, do this, do this, do this, and print? So let's go find out through my journey of how good this printer really is. Well, that was the plan anyway. I mean, I even recorded the whole thing, and that was quite a lot of work. So, what's the plan now then? Well, I can't actually get any decent B-roll of this printer working, because the thermistor stuck reading 369 degrees or whatever it is. It's stuck at maximum, so it's not gonna actually print anything, and I can't modify the firmware or anything to get it working. So I'm pretty much stuck with what I've got. I'm gonna do a bit of a quicker video instead. Basically, a quick list, a bit more than a list maybe, of my good points, bad points, and basically the reasons why I would suggest you don't buy this printer. The hot end fan does stay off until the hot end itself reaches 50 degrees C, so a little bit quieter while not printing. The frame is pretty solid, which is nice if you want to move it around. It uses NEMA 17 motors, which, while they're not the largest in the world, they are generally better than those other terrible little circle ones or any other funny third-party things you can find elsewhere. So the fact that they use some half-decent stepper motors for everything but the Z-axis is sort of promising. The PEI surface is questionable. I've never seen PEI in black with a very textured top. It looks a lot more like BuildTac. It might be PEI, I don't have any way to actually test it, but I mean, print-wise I've tested it, but I don't know if the actual material is PEI. But they say it is, so it would be good if it is, if it is. It does have a heated bed, which is nice. Small form factor printers like this often don't bother with heated beds, so the fact that it's there is sort of good. And of course, the last thing, you can print directly from an SD card without any other gubbins sort of attached. You just put it in the side and press the button and it does the heating and the printing. Whether you'll actually get a print out of it is another question, but it does have that SD card feature for easy printing if you want to do that. It's sort of headless, so it's quite nice. Now we've got all the nice things out of the way. If you just want to hear the nice things about this printer, then you probably don't want to stay any longer. So please vacate the area and find your media elsewhere. But now we're going to go through the things that I didn't like about this printer, the things that I had problems with. It is quite a big list. Firstly, trying to level the printer is an absolute pain. The screws that you've got to get to with the hex Allen key is like, they're like right in the back in the middle and it's just, it wasn't leveled from the factory, which it should have been. So as soon as you level it for the first time, after fixing other things, it's still like a mil or two away from the bed. And it's, and it's not even flat, it's not, it's not even close. So whether they move during shipping, but if it was gonna move during shipping, why even bother leveling it beforehand? The control board and firmware are closed source, so you have no access to anything on there, which to me is like a fundamental part of getting a 3D printer working correctly. The hot end is generally pretty terrible. As it heats up, you just get heat creep further up. The heat sink is not sufficient to cool down. And the fan, the hot end fan, the hot end fan is not the hot end fan. It's a hot end and part cooling fan at the same time. And it does neither very well because the RPM of the fan is so low. You can, as a result of the hot end being really bad, you never really get much more than one or two layers unless you're printing something really small. Because that heat creep, if you're printing constantly, like a large uh, bottom layer, you're, heat, you're heating constantly, printing constantly, temperature just rises up the, up the hot end, plastic expands before it gets to the nozzle, and it just jams. And then the stepper motors just clunk, 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 clunk. There's software missing from the SD card, so things that should be included, the ability to print over Wi-Fi, software for that should be included on the SD card, and it's just not there. 
The Malian Link software, which is what's missing, is also the thing that is the most terrible piece of software I've ever used. It looks like it was put together in about five minutes and functions about like something that was made in five minutes. So pretty badly. It's a terrible piece of software and the whole Wi-Fi-ness of, of this printer is just generally pretty poor because it just doesn't work. I tried loading the web page. See, this is something I don't have B-roll of, unfortunately. But I just loaded the web page. It starts, you know, placing things on the page. It's really slow. But it got like halfway through and just kept trying to load. And nothing else happened. It just didn't work. I tried again and again and again, waited for two, three hours. Still, just nothing useful. The heated bed does only go up to 60 degrees. This is like a minor complaint out of all the other things because you can do quite a lot with a 60 degree bed. You can print PETG just because it jams the whole time. The included printing profiles are pretty bad. They're just not right. <laughs> you, the, if you use those profiles that just come with it and you try and print stuff, it just won't really work very well. Not, not to mention that, but the, the G codes that come on the SD card with the printer don't use the heat bed. As I mentioned before, the control board is closed source, so you can't modify the PID values. And guess what? They're not very well calibrated. So the temperature fluctuates all over the place. When your hardware, all the hardware you're selling is exactly the same, surely the PID values are like really, really close. They could run, they don't even need to run a calibration. They just need to have run it enough on one printer that was a production model, get all those values and then shove them into the firmware that they put on the boards. That should be it. All the hardware is identical, but no, they didn't do that. So PID values are pretty rubbish and the temperature is all over the place. Not only that, you want to know what else is all over the place? The assembly. That's right. It's not even assembled correctly from the factory. On the belts, you have spring tensioners, which alone is not a good thing. And they're not put on in the right place. So you have to actually take them off and almost hurt your hands trying to put them back on again, just to get the actual motion that's supposed to happen. They just jam the printer if you don't move them. How do they not put them on in the right place? <laughs> How difficult can it be? You know what else can be difficult? The manual, because it doesn't really have everything in that you need. Uh, to me, that's sort of the point of the manual, to guide you through installing and troubleshooting and any problems that you might have, how to at least use the basic functionality of the printer. But no, it provides no instruction on, on installing the Windows driver. So if you don't get that working, you're pretty stumped but you just have to guess your way through it because there's nothing in the introductions. It's not only the PID values that aren't calibrated, but the E-steps aren't calibrated either for, that's the extruder steps. So the amount of plastic you get out of the nozzle, it's just wrong, it's just not right. <laughs> I had to put it up to like 120% to get it to extrude the correct amount of plastic. How difficult is that? It's apparently very difficult. And without access to the firmware, you can't just modify it easily. You can't set it to a new value. So you just adjust the extruder multiplier and hope that's gonna do the job. That's not how you're supposed to do it. You're supposed to modify the firmware, but you can't. That's not the only problem with the extruder though. There's also no way to modify the tension. So the clamping force on the filament between the extruder gear and the idler to sort of crush it the right amount to make sure it pushes the right amount. It's just a massive spring. Like, See, look, it's just a spring. It's just a springy thing. It's like, there's no way to adjust that. And last but not least, possibly the nail in the coffin is that the thermistor reads about 20 degrees lower, in my experience, than what you actually get. So when you want 230 for say printing PETG, what you actually get is 210, which is not really high enough. So you try and increase it, and then it goes, oh no, you can't print any hotter. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> you can, what are you supposed to do about that? Oh yes, adjust the firmware. Oh wait, you can't. Screw it again. It's just, 
there's a constant battle with this thing to try and get the basic functionality going correctly. And with so many things that just aren't right, like I doubt you would believe how many times I tried to go to print something with this and it just fails and fails and fails and fails and fails. Oh, then you get a print. I would say a good print, but that would be incorrect because pretty much every print I've had has not looked good. So I've just spent way too much time on this printer. So even making this review is just more time than I want to spend on this monstrosity. The only reason I could ever recommend buying this printer is if you were going to replace everything. <laughs> so replace the control board, replace the hot end, replace all this sort of intermediary wires because there's some proprietary ribbon cables and stuff in there that you'd have to sort out. But if you were willing to do all of that just to get a printer of this size, then it would be worth it. But it would cost you so much more than the price that they're asking for. For the 170 quid or whatever this is, it's really not worth it. It's, even if it was cheaper, I wouldn't recommend it because it doesn't work. What price do you pay for something that doesn't work? Nothing, because it's not a valid product. <laughs> Okay, I think I've probably ranted enough about how I don't like this printer. If you want to see some of the uh, more detailed, in-depth look at the steps that I went through in order to come to these conclusions, then I might have that video that you can go and watch elsewhere. Please try and just avoid just disliking it. If you want to say something, say something, make a comment. Don't just dislike it and then, you know, run off. Because at least that'd be helpful for me to know what you thought if you had a different experience with this printer. But so far for me, it's just been a complete waste of my time. Thanks very much for watching. Sorry that this one's been a little bit of a rant. I mean, it could have been more of a rant, but this was at least quick-ish and brief. So I shall see you in the next one. Jesus Christ.